Uh, morning, welcome to our What Does Brexit Look Like Artistic Responses panel. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Neil Smith. I'm joint MD of Betty. Luckily, I don't have to form a coalition of chaos because I've got with me some of the brightest brains in Britain to talk about Brexit and its artistic responses today. Um, as Samuel Johnson once said, I think, when a man is tired of Brexit, he's tired of life. Uh, and we'll keep it factual throughout the panel. Um, I'm going to, we're going to be looking at some clips of some of the films that uh, the people on the panel have been involved with and then uh, having an open discussion and then at the end, uh, if there's any questions, we've got 15 minutes for questions at the end. So I'd just like to introduce our panellists. Uh, we've got Jan Qualiani, is that correct? Thank you. Uh, commissioning Editor for Current Affairs at the BBC, uh, who's also commissioned uh, the Joe Cox film and that's called, is it Death of an MP, isn't it? It is. Uh, we've got Toby Payton, who is the, a filmmaker and the director of the Joe Cox film, Death of an MP. Tom Whitaker, who's a filmmaker and director of Pride in Rags. Shaminda Nahal, who is Topical Specialist Factual Commissioner for Channel 4, uh, and who uh, stewarded the Grace and Perry Divided Britain film. And Timothy George Kelly, who's a filmmaker and the director of Brexitania. So, I mean, in the interest of being transparent, I should say that I'm a firm Remainer, but I'm going to be <laughs> doing my best to remain impartial today. I don't know whether we can have a show of hands. Who, who, who voted to remain and who voted to remain? Any leavers in the audience today? Any, leave, any leavers? <laughs> any Remainers? Some Remainers? So that's that, that, that. I will come back to this <laughs> question later <laughs> about that's due impartiality. I mean, what about the panel? How did you guys vote? Jan? You're allowed to tell us, working for the I'm, BBC? I, I, I'm not going to be drawn. But, but what I would say is that... Um, Didn't get up in time. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, I, think, um, I, I think it was sort of easy to see both sides, easier to see both sides for, for some people more than others. Toby? I voted Remain. Tom? I was a Remainer. Jaminda? I'm a Lever and I always was. Okay, Absolutely. that's interesting. Good. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So I was, really, <laughs> I was really tempted by the revolutionary statement, but I didn't quite do it. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. that's good. And Tim? I am an immigrant. I live in East London, and I make films for a living. That's my answer to the question. Right, so, <laughs> I mean, sorry, yeah, but... <laughs> But did, were you offered the vote, you, uh, um, in Australia? I don't know if people realise this, but Australians can vote in general elections yeah, and I don't, in I referendums. Don't, I know nothing about politics, yeah, yeah. which is what So I, I could be on a tourist visa and write down on it if I've... I could register an address and I could vote in a general election on That's a tourist brilliant. visa. Is that like a Commonwealth privilege? I think so. Yeah. And so how did you vote? Oh. Ah. Okay. Remain, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll come back to that later because I think it's pertinent to our panel today. Um, so Jan, you commissioned the Joe Cox film uh, and two other Brexit uh, related films. Brexit means Brexit and the drama doc 20 Days. Yep. Um, I think we've got a clip of one of those, haven't we? Yes, we've got a clip of 20 Days which is now called Theresa versus Boris, uh, how May became PM. And this is the opening titles. Right. Probably a little out of date, Jan. Well, you know, <laughs> last few days have been tricky. It's still in the edit, that's all I'm saying, but it's out yeah. on Sunday. OK, and do you think Theresa May will still be Prime Minister then? I, I, I don't know. I mean, no. literally, we don't, do we? No. So, I mean, it's been perhaps... Sorry, if anybody would like to get married today, we're also, <laughs> we're also <laughs> going to be doing uh, civil partnerships uh, and, and marriages later. Um, it's been perhaps the most interesting time in politics in our in recent mem memory. What's your job at the BBC? How do you reflect that? What's your, what's your duty? What's your civic duty? <laughs> well, I mean, the first thing to say is that's absolutely right. You know, I mean, uh, since when has politics been so interesting and box office? Uh, yeah. You know, making political documentaries was, was uh, you know, to be fair, a few years ago, something of a chore. <laughs> but now, you know, you can put on a drama on a Sunday night and I, I, I feel that people will, will want to watch the ins and outs of what's been going on at the moment. Uh, I'm going to speak to Patrick Holland the other day and he was just going, this is bloody exciting, yeah. isn't it? You know, it is. It's gripping, um, yeah. And, and we've had three years like that, three really unusual years. Um, and there's a moment in, in this film um, about um, Boris's 
uh, speech, you know, that, that, that moment days after the, the, the referendum when he said, and, and that person is not me. And that was, that somebody quite rightly says in, 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 the, in the doc that that was one of the most significant and exciting and thrilling moments of, in politics in the last decade. And I think these keep on coming. And it's the sheer unpredictability of it. It's exciting, but it throws up a lot of extraordinary questions that we hadn't got round to asking before as well, um, both about you know, how we respond creatively, and I, I, this yeah. is one of my artistic responses, you asked an artistic yes. response, yeah. uh, so we thought we'd sort of do a little show, yeah. um, but, but, but also it raises sort of bigger questions about um, you know, Britain. I, I don't think Brexit as such is a thing that you, you, you necessarily... Um, confined programmes to, to, to make about on the nose, um, although there are some very, very good examples here today, mm. but it's quite tough to make programmes about Brexit on the nose. Um, but, 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 but boy, does it change some of our, the ways we can analyse what's really going on in Britain. And so why, what interested you about commission? Why did you commission that film? Just a great idea. It's, it's, it's one of those examples. I, I commissioned it to BBC Two and BBC Three um, uh, from the Indies, and it's one of those great examples of, of something where we sort of all know what the news reportage was, mm. but there's a complex yarn underneath it. And give a, given a bit of passage of time, and you know, sort of obviously Panorama had their sort of Laura Koonsberg. Um, piece a month or so afterwards, I think. But given the passage of time, that yarn becomes sort of delicious, and the more you, mm. you prod into it, and, and you know that this film is based on extensive research with some of the people you saw in the film and, and many more. You know, you've got a great bit of TV, and I think that's what we've continued to be looking for: is good television that complements what the BBC and other broadcasters and the media do. You know, on a routine day-to-day -day basis, that the, the the news coverage, the the analysis, that the radio, the, the broadsheet coverage, we have to go one step further. And much like the Joe Cox film, which I was just saying, again, you know, in, in that um, widely uh, 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 reported very tragic incident. There is actually a complex and fascinating story which says much more about Britain than, than people got round to at the time. And what sort of, in the wake of Brexit, what sort of I mean, you're a commissioning editor, so you're obviously receiving ideas all the time, both from in-house and externally from Indies. What, what were you getting pitched? What did people want to say following that surprising result? Uh, OK, so, so honestly, uh, there, there was quite a lot of anger. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, it's no surprise that a lot of people in this room, quite a lot of people on the panel voted Remain. I was getting quite a lot of sort of ideas which felt a little bit cross, uh, or, or, and conversely, ideas which seem to be pitched into the sort of remain side of the argument about, you know, explaining to the audience uh, what had just happened there, as if it was a massive shock. And of course, for quite a lot of the audience, it, it wasn't quite so much of a shock as it was for, for other bits. And, and that just throwed up almost instantly the complexity of commissioning anything about yeah. Brexit. Um, I got quite a lot of ideas very similar to, to the Grace and Perry Divided Britain mm -hmm. thing, which I thought was brilliant, yep. really brilliant, but without Grace and Perry and, and two pots. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, the pots make it. The they? pots <laughs> completely <laughs> made it. I, it was a great film. Yeah. Um, uh, did it, w would, would we have commissioned it um, as current affairs? Obviously, there are other genres at the BBC and other things that the BBC does. Um, possibly not, because of the sort of level of analysis there is more reflective and very personal to him. Um, and I think, for me, what we've been looking for, and maybe, and we, we know and understand that, that covering Brexit is a long, it's going to be a long process, it's yeah. barely begun. Um, what has changed so far, and it's reflected in what we've commissioned, is the political climate. Um, you know, so, so we've... we've uh, we, we've commissioned it. We, we, we were there filming throughout um, the, the referendum with Patrick Forbes in, in um, A Very British Coup. Yeah. Next Wednesday, we've got a sequel to that coming out called Brexit Means Brexit, which is full mm -hmm. of revelation. Um, but, but actually, when you look at Britain, um, Brexit has so far changed very little that we can analyse beyond the news 
footage and, and in broadsheets. Well, um, arguably, exchange rate, I uh, exactly. And so there are things that we've been looking at, but we still don't feel it's quite time to, mm. to, to sort of present that kind of analysis. But you say that you, know, you were getting a lot of sort of angry propositions. I'm going to come back, I want to come back to this later, but I mean, all, nobody in this room said they voted to leave, uh, I don't think, or certainly uh, didn't admit it. Um, do you think a lack of diversity of opinion in television is a problem, especially for um, an impartial broadcast like the BBC? Are you just getting one-sided opinions? I think it certainly raised a lot of questions in our heads, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't incidentally, point, point this... Uh, uh, anybody in particular, I think it raised a lot of questions. It, it, equally, it raised a lot of questions in certain industries. And, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, so in other industries, you know, the city was entirely wrong-footed on the 23rd of June. So it's not yeah. just broadcasting, no. but, it, but it does raise very important questions about, about how we, you know, how we broadcast fairly in situations like this. Do you think the BBC let the country down by not um, representing them in ahead of the vote? Do you see what I mean? If, if we were all surprised, the truth about surely the, the BBC's job is to make us informed. The truth about the BBC is, is it, 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 it's um, broadcast in such volume and in mm. such a lot of different ways that I think seen in the round, the, the BBC, and this is my personal opinion, did, did a pretty good job um, at, at you know, a, allowing people to, to both see the opinions on the, on the ground and, and sort of some high-level analysis of that. And certainly there's a series of Newsnight debates that went on before, mm. uh, on a weekly basis for six weeks before for the programme, for example, I thought were, were great. But at the other end of the spectrum, you've, you've got, um, you know, uh, uh, Newsbeat and all of the sort of news output for, for the younger voters who I care about passionately, mm. uh, which was doing a, a good job of lifting. But as you say, we were still surprised, weren't, weren't we? It had echoes well, some of the of banking crisis. Some of us were. Well, probably all the people in this room. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this comes to another thing that we've been churning around, and I'm sure everyone on this panel has, uh, you know, the, the concept of how you... Uh, it, 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 of sort of what bubble you're sitting in. Um, you yeah. know, and and you know how you consume media. You can't consume all of it. That that would be an extraordinary <laughs> ask. Um, but but g g there's clearly a a, a a conversation to be had about sort of what information people are be being selected for. But and not again, the BBC is a broadcaster. But what what, yeah. what information people are being narrow casted, and to what extent people are are you know, managing that wisely so that in, in, in situations like this, they're, they're not quite so surprised. So is it the BBC's job to sort of fill in gaps in people's political literacy, so to speak? Personally, I believe that, uh, it, it, you know, especially with certain parts of the electorate, um, the, the, the BBC should be uh, encouraging people to engage in democracy. I, I believe that is part of public service. So you're going to continue to commission artistic responses to Brexit as well as... Uh, as artistic as possible. Good. Glad to hear it. So Toby is actually directing or directed, hasn't been broadcast yet, has it? Tonight. Uh, tonight. Tonight, oh, yes. tonight. Tonight. Great. Tonight. So avoid the uh, guilty pleasures part. Oh, well, it starts afterwards, which is <laughs> perfect. Uh, which is Joe Cox's Death of an MP, which tells the story of one of the most horrific points in the in the Brexit saga, I guess, doesn't it, Toby? Um, can we have a look at that, uh, uh, at Toby's clip, please? So, Toby, what did you learn <coughs> from making that film? Well, I mean, a, a, a lot. Um, in terms of Brexit, I mean, I think as, as that kind of clip shows, there was a really, I think the relationship between what Thomas Mayer did and Brexit is, is very complex. Yeah. Um, I think it would be wrong to say that Thomas Mayer did what he did because of Brexit and because of the EU referendum campaign. I think it may well have happened otherwise. But at the same time, it also would be wrong, I think, to suggest that there wasn't some kind of relationship between, between the two. Um, and you can see from, I mean, what that kind of clip tries to show is how these two, as a campaign unfolds and it becomes more and more hostile, people are more and more angry, people are more and more open with anti-immigration rhetoric, mm -hmm. kind of op open racism in a way we've not really seen in this country before, I don't think. Um, at the same time, this neo-Nazi who for a long time has been angry, harboring a lot of resentment, 
um, towards the, the establishment um, is getting increasingly angry and becoming increasingly emboldened um, and you know moving towards uh, doing what, uh, what he did and I think there's there, there must have been some kind of relationship between the two it would be wrong to say that, that there wasn't so it's not just the act of a sort of, of a madman then you think it's politically I think uh, absolutely yeah I mean Thomas Mayer was, was a terrorist I think there's no yeah. there's no doubt about that um, he was a neo-nazi um, and he believed that the white race was kind of under threat he believed that white politicians like Joe Cox were race traitors and that by supporting multiculturalism and refugees and immigration they were kind of polluting and corrupting the white race and that uh, something need to be, needed to be done to, to stand up and, and protect the white race. So did you feel that that view was reflected in society when, when you went and made that film? Well, I, I felt, what, what I felt about that is that one of the things, that really, as I started to read into that kind of like, that, that kind of mayor's Nazi ideology, one of the things that really struck me was that actually, although the kind of things that people like Nigel Farage say, of course it's different, of course Farage isn't a Nazi, mm. of course it'd be wrong to suggest that he was, but there is a striking kind of similarity. These are views on the same spectrum. Mm. Um, this idea when you know, Farage will talk about the metropolitan elite, um, you know, uh, not paying enough attention to white working class communities. And you know, Thomas Mayer articulates a much, much more extreme and violent version of that idea. But it's the same, it's, 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 there, there, there's, there are similarities there. What surprised you when you went to make the film? Um, I, was, I was surprised by the level of racism and tension between communities up in in, in Yorkshire, um, there was a, a, a we found a significant minority of of people up there, uh, mainly mainly white communities, who would talk in kind of openly racist and derogatory terms about the Asian community, in a way that coming from nice kind of middle class liberal London was okay. was was shocking and was 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 unexpected. Um, and but I think the problem I think the reasons. I think what's important is to think about the reasons for that kind of racism is not... I think it's important to condemn it when we see it, but also to think about the reasons behind it. And I think a lot of that kind of anti-immigration sentiment is born out of a sense of deprivation, actually, and a sense of scarcity. And I think it's easy, perhaps, for middle-class uh, people from liberal London who are doing well in the world and have basically got everything we want to, to be liberal and to be tolerant and to enjoy the benefits of immigration. But I think when you feel like you're competing for scarce resources within your community, I think that maybe then gives rise to some of those tensions which comes kind of then spill over and be expressed as, as racism, anti-immigration. So did your viewpoint change when you went to make the film? I mean, coming from the liberal bubble. Uh, yeah, I guess, I, I guess it did. I guess it kind of forced me, by, through encountering that kind, of, that kind of racism in the way that we did, um, and people talking as openly as they did, it kind of made me realise... Um, how much of an issue there is, and then that then made me think about some of the reasons behind it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I was in Channel Four recently, and I think uh, Jay Hunt had just been on holiday, and um, realised or, or, or come to the conclusion that uh, that Brexit wasn't actually about immigration at all, but was about sort of the haves and the haves nots. And I think that's the the one thing perhaps that has become a little clearer. As you say, uh, the liberal metropolitan elite, um, uh, or Grayson says it better than me, but you know, I'm worried about their house prices and how much you know, whether they can get cheap labour. But um, you know, that's 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 a luxury, uh, and I think over the past year, perhaps that that is a uh, you know, the day after on Facebook or whatever, it was all well, racism has has triumphed. But it's a, it's a little bit. More complex than that, isn't it? And I think that's what's become clear over the past year, hasn't it? I think that's right. And I think people are angry. I think there's a lot of anger. And I think the Brexit vote was an expression of that anger. In a way, the, the election we've just had is a kind of expression of that anger in a, di yeah. in a different kind of way. Um, and I think the what happened during the referendum campaign was that anger was, was whipped up in a very kind of unhelpful <laughs> way. You know, I think Brexit focused and crystallised that anger in a way which is very negative and it focused it on, on immigration in a way which was obviously massively oversimplifying and really kind of missing the point and it would have been much better um, if that anger could have been harnessed and focused in a way which is a bit more productive and maybe a bit more insightful and that would allow us to really get to the nub of some of these problems a bit better than the Brexit debate did. If we had a vote tomorrow, another referendum, which way do you think it would go? Uh, I think people would... I mean, 
I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think people, if, if I had to guess, I think people would probably still vote to leave again. So do I, personally, but... So mm. it's, it, it was one of those things where, you know, a lot of the criticism was, how oh, people have been lied to. But I think the, re the recent election results would show that perhaps that anger is more underlying than... It wasn't, just, it wasn't just about buying a pack of lies, was it? I mean, it was a bit more serious than perhaps some of us took it for. Did you... Is that what you experience when you're making your film? I, I think that's right, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's certainly wrong to think that people were kind of conned into voting leave. Um, I, I, I don't think that's true. I think there's also a kind of... I think, I mean, the, the question now, I think probably people will feel, you know, what, what, kind, of, what kind of Brexit are we, are we going to have? Yeah. Um, but I think there's still a sense that that decision has been made. And I think part of the reason why people wouldn't... would, would stick to their leave vote and we'd still vote leave again is because... There was an, it, I think people felt it was an important victory over the establishment, over an establishment that had not paid them attention, had not taken their issues and their views and their worries seriously for a long time. And the main reason I think why we would stick with the lever is because people would be reluctant to give up that victory because I think it means quite a lot to a lot of people. Taking back control. Taking back control. <laughs> so as a filmmaker, when you hear extreme views, what's your job? I mean, if you're then broadcasting them? I mean, how do you see your role as a, you know, in terms of artistic responses to Brexit? Yeah, I think the job is to understand it. Um, and so, I would, although I, I think it's really important to, to kind of to condemn that kind of racism when you see it, when, as a filmmaker, when you encounter it, you don't condemn what you hear, you listen, you know, mm -hmm. and you, and, you know, the last thing you do is necessarily challenge people, you listen and you try to understand. And I think that is, that's kind of our job and our role as filmmakers is, is to listen and to try and, to try and understand and to present these views in a way which shed, sheds light on them. Because I think we have to believe that it's only through understanding these views that we're ever going to work out how to move beyond them, if that's what we want to do. And the same with Thomas Mayer and his kind of like, that really kind of extreme violent racism. Mm. Even then, it's no good to just condemn it and pretend that Thomas Mayer is some kind of monster and we should lock away the key and that's all there is to be said about it. It's, you know, it's not, it's not true and, and, I don't, and I don't think it's helpful. And for me, one of the big motivations with making the Joe Cox film was the desire to try and understand how and why a man could do something like that. Because if we don't try and understand it, we've got no chance of stopping it from, from happening again. And why do you think, it, what conclusion did you come to? Um, I think there was, I think although Thomas Mayer was not um, mad in, in, in any sense, um, he, there were a number of factors, some of them low level mental health issues, which led to him being very isolated. And because he was so isolated, he had, over decades, found solace in fascism. And he found an ideology that gave him a sense of purpose, a sense of a way in which he could maybe kind of displace some of the kind of the sense of disappointment and impotence he felt. Um, fascism allowed him to displace that onto, onto the other, onto immigrants, onto non-whites, onto whoever the various enemies of fascism are. And he kind of immersed himself in this world and I think created a kind of a fantasy world for himself with this. He'd just go home every night. I mean, all, all he did, he volunteered every now and again at a charity, like one day a week, and he did shopping for his mum, and otherwise he was in his house, he was reading books about Nazism and fascism. And for decades, that was a kind of a fairly stable equilibrium because all he was doing was reading. Yeah. And, but last year, for whatever complex set of reasons, that kind of, that, that fantasy world he'd create, where he'd found a solace for himself, spilled over into the real world, and he decided this was, now was the time to act. And that, I think, is maybe where the Brexit debate comes into it, because I think the kind of the energy and the hostility around and the things people were saying about immigration and the racist rhetoric and so on, uh, there's a good reason to believe that that was part of what made Thomas Mayer think that now was the time to kind of step out of this fantasy world and, mm -hmm. and actually enact. Well, good luck with the film tonight. Thank you. Tom, you made a film about your hometown, Dewsbury, called mm. Pride in Rags. Can we have a look at the clip for that, please, for Tom's clip? Tom, I mean, that was, what was it, Danny Lockwood? Danny Lockwood, yeah, so he's a kind of local newspaper publisher. He's got a little paper called the Dewsbury Press. So he's kind of like a Dewsbury's own Rupert Murdoch, Paul Dacre figure. Um, and he's also written a book about the Islamification of Dewsbury as well. And there's also a wonderful scene with him on a golf course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a little media empire, so he runs a rugby yeah. paper and a golfing place. And a uh, big fan of the film? Uh, no, he hated it, unfortunately. <laughs> which was a shame, but perhaps to be expected. So, I mean, that... Your film, which is excellent, particularly focuses on the divide between the Asian and the white community in Dewsbury, doesn't it? Why did you, yeah. why did you choose to look at that divide? So uh, Dewsbury's really interesting. Um, the Times called it the town that dare not speak its name. 
it's had a lot of bad things. So Shannon Matthews um, was yeah. there. It's had a lot of young lads run off to join Syria. One of the seven seven bombers was from there. So it's just got this whole kind of plethora of issues around it. Um, and if you met someone in Dewsbury, um, you know, if you met them in an airport, they kind of perhaps be a little bit ashamed to say they were from there. Um, it's got this really proud industrial heritage, a bit like Sheffield. It's not mm -hmm. far from here. Um, so I was kind of really intrigued about a place where people were kind of yeah ashamed to say they were, they were from, especially one that you kind of used to be so proud. Do you think that is across the community? Um, no, the Asian community I wouldn't say so so much, even though it's had a, a lot of these issues. Um, so a lot of the councillors I spoke to there, um, you know, just the older kind of working class Asian community in Jews, which quite, you know, they're really proud of where they come from. I mean, Danny obviously says some really unpleasant things, but they are yeah. a cohesive. Show. Oh, it's interesting what he's, what he's, or seems to be reflecting in that clip is yeah. something that the Asian community in the film seem to have. Yeah. So what he's lamenting for is something that the Asian community have, which is looking after each other, I guess, or a strength of... Yeah, the more of a feeling of community and pride. Yeah, the film's more about the kind of decline of the white working class, really. Um, I mean, all the mills in Jews we kind of closed down the 60s, 70s. Uh, you know, it's kind of like Bradford. A lot of people came from, um, you know, in Asia to work in the mills. But they didn't, you know, I don't think they've kind of got that emotional attachment to it. Whereas the white working class, it was in the blood. And when that kind of fell down, you know, they've never really recovered, I don't think. Um, there's a clip later in the film of a sociologist in the 70s saying, what should we do about times like Jewsbury? Shall we just let them rot? You know, I'm sure we should build new towns like Milton Keynes or whatever. And unfortunately, kind of people have let them rot, really. Um, and it's bubbled up, and, and yeah, I think Brexit's kind of a, a symptom of that, really. And um, how... D it wasn't directly a film about Brexit, was it? So what... Did you tap in... I mean, what was your... What's the link between your film and Brexit? Do you think? It wasn't a kind of on-the-nose Brexit film, so I started filming it in March, um, and we were kind of... About I don't know halfway through the edit by the time kind of Brexit happened, mm -hmm. um, so we definitely couldn't kind of let it go. But I didn't want it to be a Brexit Brexit film, perhaps like Timothy's or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it kind of needs to be addressed. I mean, white working class in Dewsbury, like a lot of the people who voted to leave, just haven't felt listened to for a long time. I think for thir you know for 30, 40 years, whether they voted red, blue, or whatever, they weren't seeing any changes. Um, <laughs> And it's kind of like a volcano, I think, in, in the Grayson film. Uh, Aaron Banks said it, someone in Timothy's film said it as well. It's, it was the first chance that people got to say, kind of, fuck you to the establishment. And they took it, and you can't really blame them. I kind of understand why white working class people in Jewish voted to leave, but I struggled a bit to kind of understand why affluent people in, you know, Chipping Norton or whatever did. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, you know, they're, they're not being listened to for so long that it's, it was actually really understandable. Um, and you, can, you, could, you could see it coming. So you think it was a protest, a protest vote? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm a Remain, the EU is not a perfect institution, but I kind of understand the things it stands for, and that's why I went for it. But sorry, just to interrupt, to add to the complexity, <laughs> it's a Polish immigrant that says it's a fuck you to the establishment in yeah, my it's film. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's across the, across the board, right? I mean, Aaron, Aaron Bank said it as well. Um, yeah, it's just a case of not, not being listened to for so long. I mean, you know, the, last, the election before last, the Jews Town Senate's an absolute... Uh, crap or not to the service, um, you know, and they were promised tens of uh, millions of pounds of regeneration money. It just didn't happen. Um, you know, the expense is still kicking around. It's really bothered the brunt of the recession, and people see through it. You know, they understand. They understand that they're bearing the brunt of something that wasn't their doing. Um, and it was their time to kind of kick back, and they took it. You can't. You can't blame them for that. And I know you. Did, you know, it wasn't specifically a film about Brexit, but mm. did you get a sense of which way both of the communities that you looked at? Voted. Yeah, so there's enough kind of factual um, numbers out there, but I mean, it's pretty clear that it was, you know, the white working class was, was voting to, to leave and the, uh, the Asian community was remain. A broad strokes generalisation. And why do you think that is? Because uh, it wasn't working. I mean, it wasn't working for the white working class there. But um, it was for the Asian communities. Yeah, broadly, broadly speaking. I mean, the Asian community is fairly wealthy. It's, you know, right. making gem slight generalisations. It's got its own issues, obviously, but things are generally working for them. Um, you know, they have still got a lot of family businesses going in the mills, uh, which are broken down. Um, you know, I think if you are, you know, if you don't do too well educational wise, then you have got business to go into. If you have got kind of apprentices of, of sort, um, you know, if you are <coughs> doing well, you'll get pushed. Whereas those family structures, social structures, just are there for the working class. In Jewsby at the minute. Thank you, Shuminda. You've um, we've already talked about Grace a little bit on this panel. Um, can we have a look at the Grayson Perry clip, please? 
Sorry, uh, uh, one of our panellists has just left because his sister's having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I think he'll be back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, that's throwing me rather. Uh, so Grayson, I think, did a really good job in that show of... Uh, it's interesting that the panel's about artistic responses as an artist, I guess. You know, he, he took the stand that, you know, it's my job to... He, right at the top of the film, he says that I'm a Remainer, I'm a liberal metropolitan elite, I live in an Islington bubble, etc., etc., but I'm going to try and fairly reflect uh, the views of the nation. Um, although I do think he sort of went a bit... He over it on the Leave people, but anyway. Um, how much is that fair to say that Channel 4 needs to do the same thing, Shaminda? Well, I, just, I should just say that um, you were very nice about me at the beginning, but um, our head of specialist factual, John Hay, actually commissioned that film. And I I've never heard of him. He's <laughs> <laughs> a very distinguished... Sorry, John. Um, <laughs> Loveliest man in television. Um, President so will be accepted. What was the question? Oh, um, I guess... Uh, did you say... What uh, well, I, I, I would just say, is it Channel 4's job to... So, as the BBC... They have a remit to reflect yeah. impartially on such a political hot potato. Can Channel 4 be a bit more opinionated? I mean, that was a very balanced film. Were you happy with that? Did you want, did you want to make a stronger statement? Did you want it, or did you want it to be... Well, I mean, that film, that was quite literally an artistic response. It was an yes. artist response. And what was brilliant about it was that Grace and Perry's work and all his films have been about exploring identity and what we're understanding about our country now is that its identity is absolutely central to people people how people define themselves is sort of feels like it's more and more important and he was a brilliant person to sort of try and get under the skin and make sense of it and literally make the artwork so it was a really interesting way of doing brexit um, in a in a sort of really different and fresh way. On the bigger question about our role at Channel 4, I mean, that is a mm. huge question, but of course, our role is to, is to try and make sense of the world in our department, especially as factual, this is the most brilliant time for us because our job is to try and get under the skin of what's happening, um, to sort of analyze, to give depth, to provide alternative points of view. Um, so this uniquely sort of combustible and volatile and exciting time is a sort of, perfect time for us um, and I suppose what I feel about it is very much like everyone else it's just so complex what we're dealing with and I think we have to be quite careful not to sort of fall into um, thinking that we understand it too quickly because it's changing so much so mm. part of what this film um, what happened in this film was it started out as a film about Brexit but then an, an election happened yeah. and that started to throw up all kinds of other questions and actually, well, I, I was at um, Channel 4 News in those kind of heady days of the EU referendum happening. Um, and it was the most exciting news story that I've ever been involved in. Although, looking at that clip, I do remember that sort of weird feeling of alienation, actually, that it was all these men kind of almost playing a chess game with all of our futures. Um, but it's interesting to remember that. But... After, I don't think it was quite as subtle as a chess no. game. That was <laughs> uh, after, um, uh, sort of after about a year, I think we all began to kind of settle into sort of a sort of settled view of what happened, a sort of yeah. commentary at view that it is about haves and have-nots, that it was about the left behind people's kind of cry, revolutionary, yeah. fuck you and cry for help and all of that sort of stuff. But um, but then, and, and then sort of that came to its sort of, apotheosis in the David Goodhart anywhere somewhere thesis that I think everybody sort of felt actually now we understand our country but then the election happened and that's thrown up loads of interesting stuff again what was meant to be a Brexit election which was meant to deliver Theresa May her mandate for hard Brexit um, actually is something so complex complex she didn't get her mandate for hard Brexit mm. you know it turned out that lots of UKIP voters obviously went to the Tories but a lot of them went for Labour. You know, it turned out, I think, but we'll, our understanding will have to grow on this, you know, there were sort of graduates who felt they had no future. There were people who were really worried and upset about public services, um, you know, austerity. And, you know, it did question the kind of Brexit that we're going to get. So, it, again, all these kind of, um, oh, the minute we sort of feel like we've got to some sort of settled position, it's all thrown up again. 
And I think, so I think that the feeling that the sort of truism that we're this divided country and we kind of understand why we are, actually the divisions are huge. It isn't just leavers and remainers, it's old and young. You know, it was only the over 65s who voted in a majority for the Tory party. We saw this amazing turnout of young people. Um, there's obviously uh, divisions in wealth, there's divisions across the country. There's a kind of, um, so there's all these sort of really complex things happening. What we thought we had sort of identity had kind of defeated ideology for a while, actually ended up being an election that's taken us back to a kind of two-party country, which where one, the Labour Party, said really openly we're going to tax the rich and was talking about nationalisation. So again, I think all of everything has been thrown up again. And I think our job, which is a brilliant time for us to be doing this job, is to try and um, to try not to pretend that we understand, to find new ways of exploring what's happening and to be really open-minded about it, to gen genuinely listen and try and feel in touch with the country in as many ways as we can. And we've heard lots of brilliant voices in the films we've seen mm. so far. And we also are looking for you know, people who have something to say about what's going on because it's, a, um, you know, it's an amazing time to sort of hear new ideas uh, and you know opinion about to try and make sense of it. But we also have to recognize that we're on this journey and we don't really know um, where we're going. So do you think it's a sort of golden age then in some way for... Well I hope so. I think it's, I think it's uh, such a unique time and I mean I just feel really excited to be in our department because we have um, we obviously sitting in a, in a world where we have brilliant stuff being done by news and current affairs. There's, you know, potentially, you know, ways of exploring it through drama. But in our department, you know, we are, we are, we are sort of our job is to grapple with what's happening yeah. um, and to sort of be in touch. And we, I mean, we would really welcome, um, you know, new talents who are genuinely saying provocative and challenging things. And I think for Channel 4 who are, you know, a channel which is, which is, which is, you know, champions alternative opinions um, and is uh, kind of interested in the new and yeah. in, in, uh, in, you know, in, in fresh responses to our, our culture, it feels like a, a brilliant time to be thinking about all this. And do you think from Channel 4's point of view, do you think some of those voices are coming through? I mean, are we going to see new presenters, new voices well, we're on all, Channel 4? We're always looking for those people so we're really open to it and hopeful that we will and I think and it, it's but it's people who have something to say um, I mean one of the other things that I find so interesting and a couple of other people have talked about it is emotion how I feel like we're becoming uh, the sort of much more emotional in a public way than um, I remember when I was growing up. Yeah. And I certainly found, particularly when I was at Channel 4 News, all the stuff, because we used to do a lot of um, short videos that were widely shared on Facebook, and at Brexit, and just after Brexit, the level of engagement with some of those videos, like it could just be a video of people talking about Brexit in bars <laughs> or something, would have, you know, 20 million views and shares really quickly. The engagement with this stuff was so big that we actually set up these kind of verticals called democracy and identity on, um, on, on our sort of face Facebook pages where people were really engaging with that. And the thing that drove things to be engaged with was all about emotion and identity. And I think that's really interesting to explore, but at the same time, it, it's also challenging because all the stuff about fake news and um, you know, facts and how do we be rational in the middle of all of these at this emotional time, I think is also a kind of challenge for us too. It's interesting, isn't it? It's sort of like, from what you're saying, it's sort of um, almost like a period of enlightenment in some way. In that, even though but we're it's all... very foggy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I think it keeps. Um, I think it, it's. Yeah, I well, think people are engaged. Yeah, and I think that's brilliant. Actually, I think it was really great to see the the sort of level of turnout, and I think people's engagement in sort of who we are and where we're going as a country is really exciting. And in terms of artistic responses, and for us as program makers or filmmakers, that's got to be an exciting opportunity, isn't it? It is, and you know, we would love to look at other you know, other artists, but it, it isn't just, it, it, you know, obviously we're not only looking for artists, but I mean, 
the, the sort of rational... Or a creative yeah, response. No, creative, we, we always want to be creative in everything we do. But, um, and I think people with a kind of strong take on what's going on or a strong view of uh, what's happening. And I love the way that in some of these films, you know, we did see parts of the country that we're not used to seeing on TV. And I hope that that is a change that's going to sort of happen across the board that we get to know um, and get to see and hear all, you know, different people that maybe we we haven't been used to. Tim, you, your film, Brexitania, gives voice, I mean, as you meant to say, it's giving voice to a lot of different people in different parts of the country and it's almost literally an artistic response in the way it's beautifully composed. Can we have a look at your clip for Brexitania? Sure, please? it's a trailer for the first festival screening. Tim, do you think the curly cucumber is a symbol of the, uh, the, whole, the whole issue? No. <laughs> what drove you to make that film? I mean... Um, I was making a film that wasn't finding its legs in London on people on zero-hour contracts. Mm -hmm. And then Brexit happened, and I saw history unfolding in front of my eyes, so I changed the scope of that film to outside the M25 <laughs> and to everywhere else involved. Yeah. And what did you learn? What have I learned? Um, I think there is a crisis in regards to hope that people might have in terms of their own identities and what they might forecast what happened with their futures, which um, materially I would actually engage with some I don't think people talk about the global financial crisis and austerity enough in reference to the political situation room right now. Um, counting inflation, and this is a TUC report, um, basically the UK is on par with wage growth with Greece. Mm -hmm. And that wage growth, this is it's the lowest, it's one of the lowest in the world in terms of the percentiles of what it's been, is actually minus 10.3%. And it's on par with the country that's probably experienced the worst political and economic turmoil of the last 10 years in Europe, definitely. Um, and then also, if we count inflation, the economy hasn't grown in 10 years. And I think in terms of what the austerity policies have actually done to a lot of people's, not even what their actual lives are like, but how they foresee the future of their lives. Um, yeah, I found a very, very sad place, but also I, I like the British temperament in so many ways, <laughs> so um, I enjoy the humour and the conversations that I had with many, many people. It was an enormous privilege to be able to speak to... I've, there's 49 characters in that first section of the film. I interviewed, I think, 108 or 110, so I've spoken to a lot of people about yeah. Brexit. <laughs> um, and that was fantastic, because I do... I do think there is... Um, there is hope to be had. And then also, I think also in regards to the election that just happened, yeah. Brexit for now has symbolically changed to something which is the opening of a possibility of something different happening. And personally, I love to see the Tory party in such chaos. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> um, so what surprised you when you made the film? I mean, because as you say, you didn't you didn't set out to make that film. So what surprised you? What surprised you about the voices, the people you were meeting? What was... Because I, I, I felt, when I watched that film, that my understanding of Brexit moved on quite a lot because it was so cool. unmediated, if you, if, if you know what I mean. Because it's, it's literally a, a, a frame, isn't it? And people in it yeah. expressing their views. What surprised you the most? Peculiar things. Um, I mean, this won't enlighten anyone, but I think one of the most surprising things was I, f I did come across quite a few times people of more evangelical Christian faiths who um, there's in t t t talking about the end of days yeah. there's references to the single currency and there's references to um, Satan coming out of the head of a, of a ten state country of somewhat that the EU recognises something existing. This won't enlighten anyone to the political situation in the room right now but that came, that came up that was mentioned around about five times. Either someone's parents so we're or someone about rapture, the rapture. The rapture, the rapture and its relationship to the European Union. Wow. That was a big, that was a really <laughs> surprising one for me. Um, and not to take the piss, but that was one of the biggest surprising things that happened. Yeah. Um, but I think I was also quite surprised 
I think um, I want, actually the biggest surprise for me also was I actually think the middle class has way more of a problem in terms of racism than the working class of the UK. Why? Um, I think a lot of working class people have, especially when we're getting closer to urban centres, have experienced more times with um, people of immigrant populations or people that aren't white in a lot of ways here or there. They might be a bit more direct in terms of, and they might use language that might be perceived as being racist sometimes, but I actually think they have more solidarity with those other working class people mm -hmm. than a lot of, um, a bit, I think, a bit more sheltered, much more business owning, conservative voting people that I was interviewing. Now, the thing about the middle class is they also know how to present themselves much better and they definitely know how to be um, wary around a camera. Yeah. Um, as all of us filmmakers would know. Um, but yes, I think also it does get framed as a working class racism issue and I think that's an unfortunate thing because I don't think it's a complete truth. Well, clearly not because obviously a lot of the middle classes of course. voted to, to leave. Just well, wanna, there's racist people that voted Remain. Sorry? There's also racist people that voted Remain. I, there's, uh, there's people in my film that yeah. you would think are leave voters because there, there's, you, it's never signified yeah. in the film. There's not like a title that says this is what this person voted for. And there's some people yeah. in there where you would just think, oh, sounds a bit racy, sounds a bit ultra-nationalistic in some slightly scary way, but they're actually Remain voters. I mean, actually, That's the complexity. in your film, Tom, there's a, there's a brilliant newspaper boy, isn't there, who I was... Oh, I, such a good character. He's an amazing such character. character. So you see him and he's sort of got some bother boots and he's tying them on in his bedroom and it's, it's a big... There's a St George's flag hanging in his window, and he's the paper boy for this right wing newspaper, effectively. And you think, here we go. <laughs> and of course, he totally surprises you because, you know, he sits on the other side. And I was immediately worried about his job, actually, which I did say to you when I first met you, did he keep his job? But actually, he didn't keep his job, did he? No, he left just before Danny watched the film, but his sister was doing the newspaper rounds and she got sacked, unfortunately. So I've got that in my conscience now. Whoa. Yep. Yeah. These, you know, films change lives. <laughs> so look, I just want to open it up a little bit. I mean, I'm going to start with you, though, Tim, because you, 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 you know, your film obviously sits outside the broadcast system, and I think a lot of us here are part of that. Do you think we've got a responsibility? Do you think we missed it? Why do you think the broadcast industry, and I want to open it up to anyone, but start with you, Tim, why do you think we missed why do you think we were surprised by the outcome of this vote? There must have been something wrong with our representation of views. Because you're all middle class and you live in London. <laughs> do you think... OK, uh, so <laughs> responses to that. I'm just the chair, so... Um, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As am I. I was yeah. surprised also. Um, but do you think that's a problem? Yeah. Of course it's a problem. Um, there's always been a... I mean... Depends if you think class exists, which it does. Um, <laughs> in terms of in terms of representations of like different class voices in so many industries, so I think it's it's something that's in should inherently be explored as something to do. But then also, how do you how do you engage with that? Because even middle class people are vying and are extremely competitive for these same same positions. It might be more privileged and it's easy for them to get them these jobs. Um, not so sure. But then it's also just inherently. Um, thinking of Brexit as a working class situation, which is, is it's not. No. It's but arguably it could be, well, if you look at a map, it looks like it's a non-metropolitan, you know, it's a, the mm -hmm. metropolitan liberal elite is the phrase, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think we're the wrong people to be doing this job is what I'd like to ask everyone. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what should we do about it? I'd like to hear from the panel and then from the audience. I mean, if the audience want to chip in now, you? yeah, I mean, this would be a good time. Well, and I, I feel very depressed by what's happened here, actually. Because, mm. uh, I, I mean, it, it, it feels like a liberal elite take on what's happening, actually. Mm -hmm. Trying try to sort of understand. And actually, it's a lot simpler than, than, you know, than, than it's made out to be. You know, it's like this intellectual liberal, you know, elite sort of yeah. analysis, you know. But actually... Working know, class people can be intellectual, too. I mean, but uh, I mean, basically, you know, one one of the main things is is calling people that want to call curb immigration racists. 
Mm. And, and, and they're not racist, really. And by and large, I mean, there will be some that are. But, you know, it, it's kind of a natural thing of, of just wanting to sort of keep a part of your own culture, actually, you know. And, and that's not being recognised. That's just totally not being recognised. And, you know, if it's not recognised, there's not a lot of hope, you know, a, a civil war's going to happen, really, you know. So, um, I mean, I think it's up to the media to actually understand, you know, instead of sort of, you know, staying in the mindset of, you know, this liberal sort of ideology, really, and, and actually understand what really is going on, you know, and, and not and not class people racist all the time, you know, because it really pisses people off. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can I respond to that? I, I think there's, a, there's, there's absolute truth in that. I, I think there's a tendency for the media to, uh, to, to report on extremes and to make them seem like they are the norm. And my impression, which is why we find it so hard to commission some stuff... Um, uh, on Brexit um, is that you know the the, the response of many voters, um, both Leave and Remain, w w uh, was refreshingly thoughtful, and well thought through, and and, and resisted labelling uh, in many respects, and that's why it's quite hard to make a sixty-minute program um, that, that that really does offer some analysis um, along the lines of what you're saying. Um, I also totally agree. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the uh, British Broadcasting Industry is, made, is making massive strides in terms of diversity, but there's simply not enough. And this Brexit has thrown up a, another shade of diversity, which, is, which, which, which we need to act on. Um, I feel that very strongly, and, and I would tend to agree with, with some of the things that you were saying. Do you think Channel 4 should move out of London in order to better reflect the views of the nation? What's everyone's views on that? Anybody? <laughs> There's a no coming from the back. But why? I'm just asking. I mean, it's a good I'm, question. I'm, I'm, why, I'm the chair. I'm asking that. that but if it moves to Manchester, how, how dramatically different yeah. is the Liberal elite well, of in Lake Central? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, I was just about to comment on that. Sorry, I'm Joe Carr. I'm the Head of Current Affairs at the BBC. Um, and this is not a comment, by the way, on whether Channel 4 should move to Birmingham. But it was interesting that colleagues' um, uh, understanding and geographical centre of gravity did shift from working in Salford. And the example which was given, which might not necessarily play into the Brexit stuff so much, was they became much less concerned about fires in Croydon, for example, which previously would have been covered on uh, national stations and then weren't. And I think you, know, you only have to leave London to really understand how different things are. Any other thoughts on that? John? I can't, I'm sorry, we can't see the audience at all here, so I, I don't know whether we can shed some light. Um, just to take your Birmingham bait for a second, um, I'm John, I'm the head of a specialist factual uh, at Channel 4. I, I think our view is sort of the people we're talking to and where we're spending our money and the people making the programmes is more important than where 50 or so um, um, commissioners sit. But it is certainly incumbent upon all of us to have to broaden our range of conversations. I mean, I was last Dotfest, I um, left and ended up driving through Stoke, and it was just before the um, referendum. One sort of look out of the car window at, the, uh, uh, at Stoke, and you could see the sort of the, the way the wind was blowing. And I think we've done actually a very good job on Channel 4 of representing what's going on in the country. You'll remember that we did Benefit Street, we did Skint. At that point, there was an outcry from some of the sort of um, London papers about making, quote, poverty porn. Yet we were actually reflecting the sort of divisions and some of the sort of uh, communities that were feeling angry about the way that, about, about being left behind. So, I, I, you know, I think. There's a sort of need for a proper national conversation and that commissioners have to be part of that, but quite where they sit is not the most important factor in the argument. And um, just to respond But to I, 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 would, I would retort to that. I think it's not particularly healthy to walk into uh, a media office and not hear a, a intelligent cut-and-thrust debate about an issue that's so important as, as, as where we stand in Europe. Um, I, I, and, you know, I, I don't think... I don't think it's the media alone, but I think most people's experiences of working in the media at that time was that, you know, for example, if you, if there was someone who who wasn't necessarily pro-Remain, they, they'd have more of a, a, a difficulty putting their views across than that, than a, a sort of consensus. And also, I, I I got the feeling that there was a sort of air of, um, you know, Remain is the intelligent choice. Um, which I think is thoroughly wrong. 
I, I think you know I think both sides, as I said, made intelligent you know had intelligent conversations amongst themselves about what the right way to vote was. I think I'm sorry, just to come back on that, I think that's definitely true. But my sense is that the hunger for the new thing and the next thing and the challenging voice and the sort of alternative perspective will hopefully save us from that as we go mm. uh, over the next year or two. I hope so. And I, what I'd say about the Grace and Perry doc, by the way, is I thought it was, you know, uh, surprisingly uplifting. Um, you know, yeah. and there's a nice thing there as well. This is not all doom and gloom, um, whichever way everyone <laughs> voted. Um, and there was something surprisingly and wonderfully uplifting about what he did with that documentary. Well, I think, as we were talking earlier, you know, as you meant to say, you know, engagement, we could be entering a new era of engagement. Which mm, is good completely. These are all positives. I mean, again, we feared, I spoke to you before the election about youth um, engagement, and, you know, there was a sort of argument at the, at the time of referendum which was a spike up from 40 percent in previous elections it's now uh, reportedly although the facts that the, the actual figures aren't out yet as you said above 70 percent that's extraordinary uh, you know we, there are good things coming out of this what about the i mean brexit has also seemingly been blamed for some cuts in the television industry as well hasn't it I mean, perhaps not on the two channels. Which are you? Well, ITV, about? Adam Crozier, uh, yeah. you know, deliberately, you know, he said, Brexit, as a result of Brexit, we will be doing X, Y, and Z. Do you think it's had an effect on our ability to create artistic responses? Has this actually happened yet? Or is this just what people talk about? Because, mm. one, we're still not out. Mm. No. And also, is, this is just people in the industry trying to work out what will happen when they don't know what will happen. So, I'm not in... I'm not in the TV industry, so is anything changing, guys, right now? Uh, from my point of view, I can't think of anything that, that's changed as a result of last June's vote. No. I mean, I think, I think, you know, we're all waiting to see what the real economic impacts are going to be, but there's no doubt that uncertainty can create, you know, financial stresses and strains, so it's probably the same as any other British industry to that extent. Um, but we, we, I mean, that's one of the fascinating things is how the economy is going to play out. I always thought it was, I, the thing I just thought was so interesting was that in the end, we always thought that we British people are so kind of sensible that the quiet majority would sort of be thinking about the pound in their pocket or whatever is the, the sort of cliche thing. And actually, a lot of people were willing to take a kind of potential economic hit you know, because they wanted to be heard and make the decision they thought was right for the country. And I, I think, um, so I, I think actually people are ready for the uncertainty of the economy. And what about, Charles, do you think any channel is properly representing the voices of the nation? You know, the, all, I, I would say that all the films that have been shown today are excellent films and have helped me personally move forward in my understanding of Brexit in a quite a level way. But do you think any particular channel represents a more diverse opinion than the metropolitan elite? Do we need to do better? I mean, what about Channel 5, for example? I mean, they are often seen as more of a tabloid, if you like, channel that maybe represents a different voice, you know? Because, I mean, because I, as I spoke to you, Jan, it was like, TV is in one place, and, you, and you're right. There, you know, if you went into a typical indie in London, you probably wouldn't hear many people vote, uh, you know, arguing to leave uh, the EU. But of course, the the papers were very vocal. So, you know, we don't see the same sort of um, diversity, if you like, of opinion on the on, on the TV on a day to day basis. Mm. What about Channel Five? I mean, what about some of the shows that they make? Are they representing a broader view? I know, Tim, you've got some thoughts on this. I mean, I think it's a problematic question because there's also just references like maybe like trash culture having something to do with Brexit. Um, but I yes. ha yeah, I mean, I have one of those, also something I discovered, which I kind of already knew, but it was very much concretized when I was filming, was to learn about class dynamics and also how confused people in the UK are around class and what class they might be in terms of this, I'm a little bit middle class, I'm a bit of working class, I'm a bit middle upper, mid, middle lower and things yeah. like this. But I think a responsibility that mainstream culture and TV has had towards this is certain things like Channel 5, like what was that, what's that bailiff show? Can't pay, we'll yeah, take it away. Can't pay, we'll take it away. These kind of like 
poverty porn thing which really actually structures and frames just being working class as being something negative, mm -hmm. which has become ideologically normalized mm -hmm. by, I would say, a liberal elite media making class that has resulted in many working class people, one, it, one there used to be such a strong working class culture here that was obviously destroyed because of getting rid of deindustrialization de and things, but the fact that, that you don't want to be working class even though you are working class creates, I think, a real crisis in identity and also has something to do with Brexit. Yeah. Um, and that's why I have problems with Channel 5, because it's a part of this. And sorry, Benefit Street too. Mm. I think it's a real, it's a real ethical issues in terms of what this does culturally as a part of the conversation. What does everyone think? What do we need to do sorry to saying. move forward? You need fresh, more regional voices, don't you? I'd be a massive advocate of moving places out. I mean, I'm from Leeds originally. I'm kind of kick-starting the industry now, but I live in London. I find it quite hard to move far north, and I think it's, it does just become a bit of an echo chamber. Even the election last week, the day before, you had loads of people saying, this is how it's going to go, and then the next day you've got them saying, well, why did you get it wrong? It's like, well, try and get people are actually going to say something fresh or something different. I think there's another sort of um, answer to that, which, which may be... Uh, 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 you know, certainly from the BBC's uh, point of view of, about approach as well, and tone, um, that uh, when you listen to uh, radio stations like LBC, people are often ringing in and saying that the mainstream media is, and whether they're right or wrong, it's interesting that many of the callers now regard, much like the, the, the votes in the States, that the mainstream media, what we represent, as something that is just one part of their whole lives. And we... we I, I think tonally could, could, you know, just there's a certain stiffness maybe that we could lose and a, a, a bit more of a kind of cut and thrust dialogue that is more honest and feels like is what's actually going on. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of places, of, of, of parts of the British society are culpable of that and I just welcome a more sort of fresh approach. Um, uh, you know that, that 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 felt like it was it was close to the conversations that are actually happening. I can see we've massively overrun. I'm really sorry that I've not uh, thrown it open to the audience. Well, uh, are there any other questions that we can squeeze in? Because obviously it's a really hot topic, sir. I, I just wanted to ask uh, Jan and Shaminda um, if you've ever been offered a sort of a non-liberal Grayson artistic response. Has anyone walked through your door who's got a, a passionate and authentic artistic voice from the, the right or the alt-right with all the consequences and dangers of maybe that fanning the flames? You know, if Lenny Riefenstahl, who was an amazing filmmaker, came to you with the triumph <laughs> of the British will... From the grave. Uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and you saw the power of, of her vision of Britain, would you commission it? Or would your responsibilities and your anxieties say you're a great filmmaker, but we can't go there? I think, I mean, that's quite, a, I mean, if, if, the, if, the, if the person who was the kind of so-called right-wing Grace and walked through our door, we'd, we'd be thrilled. We'd, we'd, we'd love that, we're very open to that. And actually that question of, you know, the artistic community as we know it being part of the so-called liberal elite is, is, you know, is part of the problem in a way. Um, but to your point about how extreme do we go in terms of opinion, um, you know, we're, we're regulated, you know, we have to be very careful about the kind of views that are aired on our channel as is, as is the same for other broadcasters. So I think we'd have to take, we'd have to look at that example very carefully. But we're, we're, we're longing to have people walking in the door who are, who are going to talk about immigration in the way that you wanted to talk about. Um, and all, all of these issues, that's, that's the whole, that's what we're all sort of longing for. And it's, it's all about balance. So, so the answer is we'd certainly listen and, and think about it. Um, you know, uh, uh, Toby's documentary contains some, um, you know, some sound bites from F Farage. We've also got access to Farage, the under, other end of the spectrum, with Brexit means Brexit. I'm not saying the whole thing rests on him, but, you know, actually the, the, the answer lies in balance, and we'd certainly listen and have a conversation about that. Um, if, it, if, if, if we wanted real diversity of views, maybe we should give Farage a rest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's also that. <laughs> Actually, you know, no, no, well, the, 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 there's also that. I think, is quite I, I think and, and this is where the dynamic of this election is really fascinating. You know, the, the UKIP vote has, has disintegrated. And, um, you know, we're into yet another 
chapter now, um, and, and let's hope we can learn from the chapters that we've seen and, and commission accordingly. So, oh, well, I've been told there's a wedding in at eleven thirty, and uh, <laughs> we have one more. Are you getting married? No, I'm like, <laughs> totally <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. I was oh, asking you, you're getting married finally. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you, Sarah. Well done, Sarah. We've been overall. Sorry, sir. I'm going to be in severe trouble if it doesn't matter. I, yeah, Very I know, quickly. I know. Well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. I, yeah, well, I, I think another problem really is like this liberal elite sort of thing, labelling people either hard left or extreme right, and you know, I mean, I think the reality is they're neither. You know, I mean, Corbyn's not really hard left. You know, you know, there's there's a more pragmatic. You know, the, the successful politicians of the future are neither, actually, you know. But, you know, it's this labelling, this emotive labelling, that uh, is another symptom of the problem, actually. I think sometimes it's just shorthand. It's, you know... It's yeah, surprising. but it's not true, though. Well, you know, as I was saying earlier, all, all of those certainties are up in the air. I made exactly the same point about the, how we think about the right and left and how we think of ourselves is, is really changing. So you're absolutely right. Any final last words before we get actually thrown out of here? No, well, thank you so much all for joining. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.